you to God. Let us pray. <coughs> Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today, a week early, I thought that we'd spend some time talking about love. We are a week away from Valentine's Day, but since Valentine's Day is also this year the first Sunday in Lent, I thought we'd talk about it this week instead, because Valentine's Day doesn't really go with the themes found in Lent. So as I told you last week, I think that we generally use the word love wrong. We talk about the things we love, like I love the caramel brulee latte at Starbucks, and I really hate when winter is over and they no longer carry it. Or, I loved the latest Star Wars movie. I thought it was great. We talk about love like an emotion, like a physical emotion, especially in reference to our significant others. Like when we first fall in love, we talk about that ooey-gooey feeling in the pit of our stomach that we have when we see that person. And we talk about the idea of falling in or out of love with someone. But in my reading of scripture, that is not how I see love portrayed. So I thought we'd spend the morning looking first at society's understanding of what it means to be in love or to love someone, and then at scripture's description of love. So first, we're going to turn to the movies. I am a big fan of romantic comedies. Like most girls, there are a few things I love more than watching a girl get her guy movie with a big bowl of popcorn, some chocolate, and my girlfriends. Seriously, I love to watch them. But I think they give us an unrealistic expectation of what our romantic relationships will be like, and really just an unrealistic idea of what life is like in general. So first thing this morning, I thought we'd start with a little movie magic, a compilation of some of the best romantic lines from the movie. So, Barry, roll tape. I love that you get cold when it's 71 degrees out. I love that it takes you an hour and a half to order a sandwich. I love that you get a little crinkle above your nose when you're looking at me like I'm nuts. I love that after I spend a day with you, I can still smell your perfume on my clothes. And I love that you are the last person I want to talk to before I go to sleep at night. I came here tonight because when you realize you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. Hear this now. I will always come. How can you be sure? This is true, though. I hate the way you're always right. I hate it when you lie. I hate it when you make me laugh. Even worse, when you make me cry. I hate it when you're not around and the fact that you didn't call. But mostly I hate the way I don't hate you. Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even at all. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have parents. Now, now. He's looking at you, kid. I, I, I realize this comes at a very inopportune time, but I really have this gigantic favor to ask of you. Choose me. Marry me. Let me make you happy. <laughs> I love you. I know. <laughs> How did that become the most romantic line? Thank 
Bob Withers. I wrote you every day for a year. You wrote me? Yes. It wasn't over. It still isn't over. I love watching, listening to your reactions. That was my <laughs> favorite part of this whole thing. So, um, so they're great, right? Some of my favorite movies are found in those clips. Um, but I don't know about you and your husband or wife, but the closest my husband and I have come to one of these movie moments are conversations like the following. Dwight, will you come up to the microphone? <laughs> I did prepare him for this, by the way. <laughs> Have you done the laundry? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did the laundry last night. I did uh, all of my Under Armour stuff for Raven's Band, and I got my dress shirts done, and my slacks, and my that one Panther shirt that no one here thinks I still have, and I got, oh, a, a load of the girls stuff done, okay, too. Okay, what am I supposed to wear all week? Um... Yeah, okay. Uh, so I noticed uh, I noticed that you went to the grocery store like I asked you to, but... Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That is a lot more bags oh. than the two things I asked you to go get. Well, I, I thought I'd be... Um, I love you, and I thought that I would make dinner <laughs> all week just so you don't have to. So I bought stuff for dinner. The whole week supplies oh, really, of dinner. Really? What, what, what? I'm really afraid to ask this question. What did you buy? Well, we got frozen pizza and frozen uh, fish sticks, and I got... Uh, SpaghettiOs. It's going to be great. Did you buy any vegetables? Corn. <laughs> you can go sit down now. <laughs> in our relationship, there are few, if any, sweeping big romantic conversations like the ones we saw in the movies. That's not what gets you through a marriage, right? What gets you through a marriage is actually doing your wife's laundry. That's what gets you through. <laughs> So then, uh, after I thought about all the romantic movies I've watched in my life, I turned to Facebook and I asked my friends to share with me, some of you included, all of the cliches about love that we know. I started us off with my personal unfavorite cliche about love, which is, love means never having to say you're sorry. I started with that one because, I'm sorry, that is just a load of baloney. It's in fact the opposite, right? Love means that you say I'm sorry a lot, a lot. But here's a list of a few more that they gave me. Love hurts, love will set you free, love will keep us together, love is just a four letter word. He loves me, he loves me not, which my friend pointed out is best done with a daisy in your hand. You only hurt the ones you love, all spare in love and war. If you love me, you would. Money can't buy love. Lose your love when you say the word mine. If you love something, let it go. If it returns to you, it loves you back. Love makes people do crazy things. Endless love, true love. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. The McDonald's theme song, ba da ba ba ba. You, you guys are supposed to finish it. There you go. I'm loving it. Love, uh, love is not love until you give it away. Love isn't everything. And a few more that I thought I would share through the new media format of memes. So, Barry, will you put the first one up? This one, if you can't see it, says love is blind with a picture of a heart with closed eyes. I just thought it looked funny. <laughs> this is my favorite, though. If love is blind, why is there love at first sight? <laughs> love is all you need. False. You need water and ration rations. <laughs> love is a two-way street, so watch out for bad drivers. <laughs> love makes the world go round. False. The conservation of angular momentum makes the world go round. Love is an open door. I did this for all Disney fans. If you haven't seen Frozen, that's one of the songs they sing. Uh, oh, and this is really true love. This was not one of the ones that people put on Facebook, but this is my idea of true love. It says, if you can't read it, it says, if he truly loves me, he'll just let me sleep. So, those are all our ideas from society about what... Oh, I forgot this one. Love is a battlefield. Keep on fighting. Can we save that one, Barry? I'm going to put that one up in a minute. Yeah, just leave it. Leave it wherever. It's fine. 
Okay, so the passage we read for this morning is from 1 Corinthians 13 and is one of the most widely used and known passages in Scripture. It's a beautiful poetic description of love. This passage has been read so often in wedding ceremonies, I can't even tell you the number of times I've used it in a wedding, that we sometimes forget that that was not the original context in which it was written. When Paul wrote this passage, he did not have a couple getting married in mind. Instead, he was writing to the entire church at Corinth. Corinth was a church wrestling with conflict and division, and so he writes them a letter to kind of set them straight. And one of the sections that he writes is this beautiful chapter about love. The church at Corinth was primarily a Gentile church. In those days, you were either, uh, you were one of two things. You were either Jewish or you were Gentile. There were Jews, and then there was everyone else who were Gentiles. All of the other religions fell under the category of Gentile. That means that most of the people who were a part of the church in Corinth were not born Jewish. Instead, they were folks from all over the world who had previously worshipped all different types of gods, but had been converted to follow Christ. The city of Corinth was marked by a really steep class divide. There were a few really, really very wealthy folks, a whole lot of very poor folks, and not many people in between. Throughout the ancient world, Corinth developed a reputation for having wealth without culture and for having a blatant disregard for the poor. They did not, as a city, have a very good reputation. It was a place where those passing through could cut loose and enjoy life before going home. It's kind of like um, Vegas, right? What happens in Corinth stayed in Corinth. When the church was formed in Corinth, in, in many ways, it was a microcosm of the city. It consisted of a few believers from the very wealthy section and a whole lot from the very poor section. And that obviously caused a lot of tension within the church as they began to follow their faith and to learn how to live together. The wealthier people we uh, hear uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians were arriving early for the Lord's Supper and partaking of the choicest samples of food and getting drunk on the communion wine before the poor members of the congregation could get there. It was the wealthy that tended to drag others into court to settle matters. So in Paul's letter, in general, Paul is objecting to the ways that some of the Corinthians were using their worldly power and status to manipulate their way within the church because that's all they knew how to do. So Paul's response to this division and conflict within the church is to focus them back on what they have in common, that's Jesus, and to remind them that they need to treat each other with love. It's really good advice for how to respond to any kind of division or conflict that we face in our lives today. So after spending a lot of chapters kind of doing the minutia of how they needed to act together, Paul then goes on to the chapter we read to describe what love looks like. He uses language that is beautiful and poetic, so much so that when we read this passage, most of us are much more focused on how this passage makes us feel than on what it actually says. When you stop to think about what it actually says, it's basically a really nice way of saying love is really, really hard and a whole lot of work. Paul says it much nicer, though, doesn't he? Relationships are hard. They do not flourish on their own. They need to be tended to. We all know that that's true. We have all experienced times when we have been hurt by someone or a relationship that didn't go exactly the way we wanted it to, whether that was a romantic relationship or the relationships in your family or with your friends. But in the constant pulls and stresses of life, we sometimes forget that relationships are work. 1 Corinthians is a good reminder of how we are called to act towards one another. You'll notice as we read the passage again, Barry, could you actually put up just the beginning of 1 Corinthians for me? You'll notice as you go through it that all of the things listed in this passage are how we act towards one another, not how we feel about one another. That's because Paul is saying to us that love is an action. It's not something that we feel. For instance, Paul tells us that love is patient. Someone once said, patience is a quality you admire in the driver behind you and scorn in the one in front of you. That's true, isn't it? We all want other people, other people to be patient with us, but we aren't so quick to be patient with those around us. 
Who can say that at the end of a long day where nothing seemed to go according to plan, you respond in a particularly patient way when you get home and find that your children didn't do the dishes like you asked or your spouse didn't pick up your suit from the dry cleaner that you have to wear to a meeting tomorrow morning. Or who here, this is a very recent example, can say that around day three or four of being snowed in during the blizzard, you were feeling patient towards your little brother or sister or your spouse or your children or the dog. I'm guessing not many, many of us can say that. Patience is one of those qualities that sounds really nice, but not too many of us have. Paul also tells us that love is kind. Kindness is one of those values that I think is undervalued in our society. The smallest of kind gestures can make a difference in someone's day. Maybe it's as simple as a smile or a wave or letting a car in front of you in a long line or helping um, one of the shorter people around us reach something on the top shelf at the grocery store. I often have to ask people to do that for me. Love, he tells us, seeks good for others in even the smallest and simplest of ways. Paul tells us that love does not boast. Now, by the way, boasting doesn't have to be done out loud. A lot of times, us good Christians keep boasting to ourselves, but we do it like in our heads. Boasting can be as simple and subtle as thinking to ourselves, I can do that better than they did. Or when was the last time someone else did the dishes instead of me? Or when we get frustrated or impatient with somebody who's trying to fix something and we literally take it out of their hands and say, just give it to me, I'll do it. Or guilty, right? That's boasting. We are being boastful any time we think or act as if we are better than someone else. Paul tells us love keeps no record of wrongs. It is so easy in the middle of a fight to bring up past incidents. When we get into a fight, instead of getting hysterical, some of us, a friend of mine says this, some of us have a tendency, instead of getting hysterical, to get historical. We fight with friends and we bring up every time they ever snubbed us at school or told someone a secret they weren't supposed to. We fight with coworkers and we bring up every time they were late on a deadline or gave us wrong information so that the project was messed up. We fight with our spouses and we bring up every time the toilet seat was ever left up or every time they spent too much money without talking to us about it. Every time we do that. We've talked about um, this kind of thing when we've talked about forgiveness in sermon series before, but Paul reminds us that when we are loving one another, we keep no record of wrongs. We don't keep updating the database in our head or the list in our head of what our loved one has done to us. We let it go. Now, here's the other thing about this passage. In Greek, there are three different words for love. There's the word eros, which means romantic love. There's the word philia, which means brotherly love, like the city of Philadelphia. And there's the word agape. Agape is God's self-giving, selfless love towards us. And that's the word that Paul uses in this passage. Really, you could go through this passage and substitute the word God for the word love. God is patient. God is kind. God is not envious or arrogant or boastful or rude. God keeps no record of wrongs. God endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things. When all else fails, there is God. You see, this description isn't meant to be a description of love between husband and wife. It is a description of what God does for us, towards us. And when we let God, it is a description of what God can help us do for one another. Paul's description in this passage of how we are to love one another can be really overwhelming. It can feel like something that we can't live up to, but it's wonderful to imagine being part of a community that loves like that. But it's also convicting to know that's how each of us are called to act. So I want you to um, take a little exercise right now. Barry, could you start at the beginning? And we're going to scroll through it really slowly. And um, actually, start on the next slide, yeah, where it starts, love is patient, love is kind. So I want you to read this to yourself, except for every time you see the word love, replace it with your name. Take a minute. We're all going to do that now. Barry, just go really slowly and um, go through while we read it to, to ourselves.
How did that feel? Did it feel good or encouraging, overwhelming, convicting? I personally always find it to be really humbling and convicting when I do that as a practice, because for each one of those things, I can almost immediately think of a time, usually quite recently, when I have not lived up to that description. This love thing, this Christian love, this agape love that God calls us to is hard, and relationships are hard, whether they're with our spouse or our friend or our children or our coworkers or people in the church. There will be times in every relationship we have when we do not feel like acting this way towards one another. There will be times when we are tempted to think that it would be better to just trade in this relationship for a newer model. It's awfully tempting for us to look around and think the grass is greener on the other side and to forget that no matter how green it looks now, it's not going to stay that way if we don't tend to it, if we don't work at loving one another. Our relationships weren't meant to be disposable. We are not disposable. They need to be watered and tended to. We have to work at loving one another. So if you find that things are looking dry and crispy where you are, then ask yourself how you've been tending to your relationships. Have you been patient with your spouse? Have you been kind with your children? Have you been forgiving with your coworker? Have you been humble with your friends? Have you sought to honor others above yourself when you're at church? If you find yourself answering no to any of these questions or yes to ones that you've harmed other people, that would be a really good place to start trying to be that way again, to start trying to be patient and kind and humble. And if you find yourself feeling that the well has run dry and you have nothing left of that agape love to give to those around you, then I invite you to lean into the one who is love, who is all of these things, to the one who is always like this, because that is God's very nature. And let that God, the God of love, help you to learn to love in new ways. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.